achievements are well known. She's, among other books, the author of The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, for which she received the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. She has three appointments at Harvard as a professor of law, professor of history, and a professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, she's also a MacArthur Fellow and a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. So please join me in welcoming Annette Gordon Reed. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice to, to be here. I have sort of an interesting, I had sort of an interesting journey to Andrew Johnson. He's not someone that I had spent a lot of time thinking about in my life. I mean, I knew him like anybody who's been to high school and college would have understood that there was a president called Andrew Johnson. But it was not something, he was not something that was a focus for me like Say Jefferson has been a focus for me, or Monticello, or slavery, or any of the subjects that I spent most of my career, my academic career, studying. I came to Johnson um, because I was asked to do the biography by Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., the late Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who I knew from the Jefferson world. We were on the board of advisors of the papers of Thomas Jefferson, and I knew Arthur from that. We'd occasionally talk at meetings and so forth. And he was the one who had the idea of having me do Andrew Johnson. I got a letter one Saturday morning, out of the blue, from him, asking me to do this. And it was sort of a surprise. As I said, it was the, the last thing I would have ever thought that someone would ask me to do. But I decided to do it because Arthur asked me, and you know, when people you like ask you to do things, you are inclined to do them. And also because the senior editor, the person who would, I would be working with on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in doing the book was a man named Paul Gollop, who was the editor of the book that I did with Vernon Jordan, Vernon Can Read. So that was two friends here who were asking me to do this project. And that weighed very heavily in my decision. And in doing that, it was going against something that had been sort of a long-standing feeling I had about the era in which Andrew Johnson lived, the era of Reconstruction. I write about slavery, which is not a pleasant topic. It's very difficult going through the records of slave owners, plantation owners, and reading about the lives that slaves led and the, the blighted nature of their existence, even in the face of feelings awe and amazement at how they were able to survive and to, to triumph in a way, in a sense of, of having the kind of hopefulness that let them go on and have me, as a descendant of slaves, be able to stand here before you tonight. So there was that aspect of it, but it's very, very difficult to read these things. Reconstruction is more problematic for me because it was a time of lost promise. There's something about a period when you know that things could be different. People could have done things differently and you watch them make choices that you're saying, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. Because we, we, we have the benefit of hindsight and we can look back, which is of course 2020, and we can look back and we can say, if you had done it this way, this would have happened. And so also to think about the former slaves, the kind of hopefulness, jubilee, you know, at the end of slavery, the kind of hopefulness that people had that, okay, now we can begin to live as human beings. We can have our families, and there are these pointed stories about people putting ads in newspapers, um, looking, for, for, looking for their families, and stories about people crisscrossing the nation, nation trying to pull back together people who had been sold away from them and that they had lost. And so, in the midst of all of this, it was a time of hope and people thought that things were going to be different. But to see that era as a time when those hopes are dashed, it's the dashed hopes that make this so much more difficult for me than slavery. Slavery is tough, but it's the rising expectations. Historians say that revolutions take place not at the, at the deepest point of misery. 
it's when people have rising expectations and then they say, wait a minute, you know, things could be better. And so I envision people who would have been my great great grandparents and others who were hopeful and to see those hopes dashed. So I had avoided that era. I'm an 18th century historian and academic historians typically stay in one period in order to gain the kind of expertise and comfort that you have to have to be able to talk about your subject matter, there's sort of a limited range. People don't go from Middle medieval England to you know modern England. And, I mean, it's world historians do to agree, but most historians are in, a, in an era, and I'm in the 18th century. And Andrew Johnson is very firmly in the 19th century. And I come into the 19th century a bit until about 1826 when Jefferson dies. And I'm working on another book about the Hemings family, and I will have to go further into the 19th century. But that's something that I, it's nothing I had ever done before. So Arthur and Paul asking me to do this was a plus. My dread of going into this era of dashed hopes and dreams uh, weighed in the other side. And then I decided to go ahead and do it because in some ways, I, I was thinking, about, why did Arthur ask me to do this? Of all people, why, why Andrew Johnson? And, as I, and I never asked him about it, but I, as I think of it now, it makes sense. Because I study the founding generation, the founding era, and the Civil War and Reconstruction really is the sort of end product of the things that they did not take care of during the founding period the Constitution, the problems with the Constitution, and slavery, slavery as an issue. The thing that they put off and said, this will resolve itself, it got resolved with the Civil War. And the other question, what was to become of black people, how would black people fit into the, to the, uh, the body politic, was something that the founders talked about, Jefferson in particular, and the sort of liberal enlightened position was, that he had, and John Marshall and James Madison, uh, was that emancipation plus ex expatriation was the answer. That they were gonna solve the dual problem, of slavery and the problem of race. Blacks as an alien group of people in the Americas, the way they saw it. The liberal position was emancipation and then out of the country. The conservative position was no emancipation, just continuing on in the way that, that we are. So. No one at the time really thought very seriously about how you would meld black people into the body politic, which is of course what Reconstruction and Johnson's era is about. Johnson was not the war president. I mean, he was obviously president during the war, but Lincoln is the war president. Lincoln was responsible for prosecuting the war um, successfully to its end, and Johnson came afterwards. And so it's Johnson's duty to answer that question. By this time, it's pretty clear that emancipation and expatriation is not going to happen. You have four million African American people, and they're not going to go. They weren't going anywhere. Lots of American black males had served in the war to help preserve the Union. How do you tell people after they fought and died for this country, though, oh, by the way, it's not your country, you all have to leave. So expatriation is off the table. So the question becomes, what are you going to do with these people who are in our midst, who have been seen as property, who have not been a part of the body politic in the way that we, we think of Republican citizens, Republican citizenship? So Johnson is left to answer that question. And the conclusion that I came to in working on this, once I decided that I was going to throw myself into this and find out as much as I could about him, is that in some ways he was the worst person for the job at that particular moment. I've heard of the right man for the job at the moment. He was sort of decidedly the wrong man uh, for this particular job. And the reason he was wrong, I mean, there are lots of ways I, I, I talk about this, but you can sort of locate the beginnings of the problems with Johnson in his childhood. And so I had to go back and find out as much about that as I possibly could. It's a bit difficult. I mean, it's, it's an interesting process for me to go from writing about Jefferson to writing about Johnson. Jefferson has 18,000 letters that he wrote over the course of his life. Uh, another you know, 30,000 letters or whatever that were written to him, something like that, is taken 
30 years to do to, to do all of his papers. It's, we're, you know, we're putting out a, a volume a year now, and they, they expect this will be over in the next 20 years or something. So to go from a mountain of information, that's just the letters. You know, it's not the other kinds of documents, it's that. So you have a lot to work with there. Not a lot about his childhood, because he, there was a fire, and all, a lot of that was just, uh, destroyed in 1770. But still, there's a huge body of information. To go from a president who wrote a lot all the time to a president who did not learn how to write until he was in his early 20s. Andrew Johnson uh, was illiterate until he was about 18 or 19, and he learned to read. His wife, he married young, his wife taught him how to write. Reading and writing were separate in those days. People learned how to write, excuse me, to read in order to be able to read the Bible. Writing was not something that was thought of as necessary. Um, so he, those two things were separated from him and for him, and they came to him late. And he claimed later in life that he did not like to write because he'd hurt his arm. But scholars believe that having come to it so late, he was always self-conscious about his abilities in that area and did not produce lots of writing. Um, there are some things, um, a phonetic speller with you know, lots of misspelled words uh, that we have from him in his early life, but not as much as you have, as I said, with a, with a figure like Jefferson. So here's a person who's born to poor people. Uh, parents are both illiterate. His father dies when he's three. His mother remarries not long after that, but she marries a person who is almost as poor as he, as she was, I and mean, didn't really help her in any substantial way. She ends up having to put her sons out as apprentices. Uh, and he's apprenticed to a tailor. While he's in the tailor shop, men come by to read to the tailors. You think of sort of civic mindedness during that time period. People knew that the tailors didn't know, these guys didn't, these boys did not know how to read, and people came to read to them. And he became enthralled with one particular book, a book of speeches that a man read to him. And he loved it so much that the guy gave him the book of speeches. You think about a small gesture like that that set somebody off on a path that who knows if he would have gone on if this, this guy had not come in to read to them and had not had given him this book. He memorizes the speeches and he's enthralled with speech making. The other thing about him is that being an intelligent person, because you know, I should say Andrew Johnson, you probably may know this, is ranked as one of the worst presidents. So you have the interesting thing about doing a book by somebody who's ranked as one of the worst presidents um, in history. And in fact, just before I published the book, he, the year that I was you know, turning in the manuscript, he was ranked the worst for the first time. I've always participated in these surveys, and this past year I didn't. And the, one that, the year that I didn't, he gets ranked last. I don't know what happened between you know, the year before and the, this one that made him uh, the last, I, I, I suspect, I wonder if it's because of Obama's election. If people, if race was not on the mind of other historians, if they're thinking about this and, and, and all of a sudden he slips past Buchanan as the, as, the, as the worst president. But even though he's considered the worst president, all the men who are president, you don't get to be president of the United States having nothing going for you. I mean, even if you're not, you know, Jefferson or Lincoln or something like this. All of these people were extraordinary in some way. And Johnson is extraordinary um, because of where he came from and how far he rose. As I said, to come from extreme poverty, illiteracy for a, most, a good part of his young life, uh, unable to write until he's in his 20s, to the highest office in the land. Um, it shows, it suggests a great deal about his character positive and negative, the stubbornness that allowed him to defy conventional wisdom and go forward was the same kind of stubbornness that did not allow him to make the kind of adjustments and changes that he needed to make when he became president of the United States. So investigating the early life was useful to me to try to figure out you know, what, what happened to him, how did he um, become the person who ended up being the sort of wrong man at, the, at a very, very critical time. So he becomes enthralled with speech making, he joins a debate society, forms a debate society, and then the people in the town, his area, he's, from, he's born in North Carolina, 
um, migrates to Tennessee, the people in his area see him as someone who has a future. And he begins to climb the rung of the political ladder from the very bottom, alderman, mayor, every stage of a political you know, life that you could have, he was there. And along the way, gathers a reputation as a very, very fervent spokesman for the common man. He was for the Homestead Act. He thought that there should be, uh, once he gets into Congress, he, he champions the Homestead Act. He thinks that poor white people, and this is the issue, poor white people, only poor white people, however, should have land because it would bring about independence for them and they would not be bullied by the more prosperous members of the community. He was for public education and that probably came because of his own deprivations. He was always a champion of those two things. So that sounds pretty good, right? You know, land for people, independence, um, public education, educate everybody, give everybody an equal shot in life. But he only wanted it for whites, was the issue, was the problem. He developed a virulent, virulently hostile attitude towards African Americans. He felt, and he actually said this, there was, and I, I described the scene in the book, and I can have, I can have fun with these things, that's the, that's the great thing about him. Um, he says this to a delegation of African Americans when he's in, in the White House, including Frederick Douglass. He thinks that, he thought that white planters and enslaved people were in league with one another to keep down poor whites. And he, you know, you could imagine Douglas thinking, what? <laughs> Come again? Um, but his, he thought, he blamed the planters, the planter class, for the Civil War. He said they led, they led the poor white man astray fighting this battle and that their African slaves, uh, African American slaves, he didn't say African American slaves, they're Negro slaves, he would have said another word. Um, they, are, they look down on us too, is essentially what he thought. And now people ask me, because I talk a little bit, I do a comparison in the book uh, between Johnson and Lincoln. Lincoln was poor too, growing up. You know, he had he had hard you know the, the stories where they you know reading and writing on the shovel you know in the uh, in, in the in the log cabin, but his hardships had a different effect upon him. Um, people say, well, why is it that Johnson developed such a hatred, such a hostility towards African Americans when his situation was not very far different from theirs? Well, that's the problem. It could be that people, some people, need people to look down upon, in a way. And that, instead of making him empathetic towards uh, slaves and black people, it made him hostile. You remember, he was the apprentice. He actually ran away from his apprenticeship, and it was a, an ad place for him, like a runaway. I mean, the kind of thing that you think of when you think of runaway slaves, you know, runaway. <laughs> Andrew Johnson, a description of him and his brother. And, you know, to be white, in a society like that, and to be so marginalized, to be just so close to the people who are below you, I, I think this is psychoanalyzing him, but the only thing I can't think is that those experiences of deprivation and the sense of, of um, anxiety about class status really colored the way he viewed African Americans. So that's the Johnson who is a, a friend of the common man, advocate of public education, who is a staunch Jacksonian. This is the other key point about him. He's a staunch Jacksonian, and he believes in the Union. He sincerely believed that the United States of America should continue as a nation, north and south. And so when secession comes, he is totally against it. He is the only Southerner who remains in Washington, remains in place in the government, and he becomes vilified throughout the South because of this. People see him as a traitor. Um, he saw them as traitors, too, and he talked very, very harshly about uh, punishing traitors. People in the South were more afraid of him than they were of Lincoln. Lincoln was, during the war, somewhat conciliatory. He was constantly trying to, to say, look, you know, <laughs> we can work this out. I mean, 500,000 people dying. But he's saying, you know, we can, we can do this. And 
when he's going to be reelected, he decides that as a signal to the South, what he would do would be to pick a Southerner to be on the ticket. He, we don't quite know how this is done. Lincoln was a deft politician, but all of a sudden Hannibal Hamlin, who was his vice president, is out of the picture and Johnson is in. And Johnson at the time, he pointed Johnson the military governor of Tennessee, and he thought that this is, this is a war governor, a Southern a person from the border state of Tennessee in my, you know, in my orbit, in my uh, camp, and this will tell the Southerners that I don't hate all of you. See, I'm working with one of you. I'm willing to make this, this person my vice president. Um, Johnson accepts this very, very you know, readily. He's very anxious to do this. He goes up to um, the inauguration, and he's drunk, uh, which I also have a lot of fun with in the book. Um, he had been ill, and at those, in those days, the people thought that, that liquor sort of cured what ailed you, and he drank too much. And uh, it's just, it's, it was a fiasco, and as I said, it was great fun writing about this, um, because people made fun of him then. Yeah, I and mean, you could imagine something like that happening today, right? You'd never hear the end of it. And people went to Lincoln and said, you gotta get rid of this guy. And it was terrible, cool. Think of it, this guy who has this terrible class anxiety, who is seen as being marginalized at the bottom of society, is drunk at the inauguration. And people were saying, see, <laughs> we told you, let these people into these positions and here's what they do. So Lincoln remained loyal to him. Don't have a lot of you know, he says, you know, Andy's not a drunk, he'll be fine, you know, we gotta go forward. And then of course we know what happens. Not long after the inauguration, Lincoln is dead, murdered by John Wilkes Booth, and Johnson's president. People in the South are terrified because they were had been defeated, and this was at the sort of the lowest point of their of their lives at this point. And then a, you know, John Wilkes Booth kills the president, and people feel that there's gonna be retribution, so they're frightened. And then they're frightened of Johnson, because as I told you, he had been going around saying, you know, got punished traitors, treason must be punished, these people, we have to hunt them down. He'd been saying things like that, so they were sort of sitting there wondering what he was going to do. And then something happens. Johnson realizes that the very people, that he, that the people in Congress, the so-called radical Republicans, the Republicans were divided between radicals, moderates, and conservatives. But all branches of those, all of those groups, from radical to the conservative, believed that there should be black political rights. So all along the spectrum, the radicals wanted to do more things, but, but as a basic tenet, they said, we've got to give blacks political rights, or they're not going to be protected. And I, my theory is, because people say, well, what happened to Johnson? He started out wanting to punish traitors, and for a while, he does kind of, he makes them come before him personally and ask, you know, like, you know, for, for forgiveness and to come back to the Union. But then all of a sudden, he starts to put people back in place. He inaugurates the program, he puts people who were in power back in place. And I don't think it's a mystery at all as to why he's doing this. He decided, you know, well, who do I hate more? <laughs> you know, what, what, about, what, what do I fear more? Transformation of my home territory, you know, giving black people political rights, or do I just want to keep sticking it to the planners? And I think, and well, it's clear, he, he changes his policy. And he opposes all measures for bringing blacks into political rights. He says, this is a white man's government, and it's going to remain a white man's government if I have anything to, to say about it. He begins to oppose every single thing, the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, Civil Rights Bill, Freedmen's Bureau Bill. The idea of, that was encompassed within that was the idea of giving blacks land, sort of land reform. He was opposed to that. Um, a person who had worked very, very hard, as I said before, to give land to poor whites, he says, well, you know, it'll just make them lazy. You know, if you give black people land, they'll be lazy and something for nothing, but when it was poor whites who were getting land for next to nothing, it was to buy independence. So his extreme antipathy towards black people was a problem for reconstruction, <coughs> answering that question, as I said before, about how do you fit these people into the body politic. 
And so this is how he is the wrong man uh, for, uh, for the times. He opposes Congress so much that eventually they decide that they have to get rid of him. That this is not just, this has gone beyond sort of political, uh, you know, political questions here. This, I mean, uh, you know, legal questions and, and the president faithfully executing the office and, or, and sort of having political differences about some things. He's opposed to the entire program. And he goes through the impeachment uh, process. Uh, we've only done this twice. Uh, in our nation's history. It's something Americans don't like to do. You prefer, we prefer to either just wait it out. If we think somebody's a disaster, you say, okay, you know, we're counting down. He's got one year and two, you know, and you're just counting down and then you vote the person out or you vote him back in and, you know, wait till the, the second term ends. But we don't like to throw people out. And indeed, people didn't want to throw Johnson out because the person who would have come next was a man named Benjamin Wade who was very much a radical Republican. He believed in things like women voting, which subjected him to no end of ridicule, obviously. So, you know, you think about history and contingencies, right? <laughs> How different um, the, the world could be just by people making different stories. I mean, a lot of times people, different decisions, a lot of times people think of history as something that's inevitable. You're just sort of marching towards this inevitable thing. And, Little stuff, an assassin's bullet, one vote in the Senate, all those kinds of things just change it. And things could, in fact, have been different. But people were afraid of Benjamin Wade. He didn't have very much to go on his, on his, um, uh, on his term. And, you know, he promised, he actually met with some senators, people who, and, and said, promised to be good, essentially. <laughs> he said, you know, I, I'll, I'll be good, I promise. And he's not thrown out of office. He continues sort of as a lame duck vetoing things and they just overrode them and eventually he had you know, no, no power. He leaves office and with one thing on his mind, vindication, vindication, he wanted to be vindicated and he comes back into the political arena, he tries twice for office and then finally he's returned to the Senate in triumph, he thinks. And I guess it was a triumph to go back into the well of the Senate where they had been trying to throw him out and there he is again. Uh, but he doesn't get to serve out much of his term. He dies a few months after of a stroke, uh, after he made his uh, way back into the arena. And he died a satisfied man. And I should say, even though he was a judge, or has been a judge now as one of the worst presidents, for a good amount of time, he was thought of as a great president. And he was thought of as a good president, and it shows you how historical fashions change. But he was thought as a, of a good president, of as a good president when people had a negative view about Reconstruction. When they saw Reconstruction as you know, an era when they were trying to force what they would have called Negro rule onto white people in the South. And the so-called Dunning School that saw Reconstruction as this great tragedy and black people were not ready for the vote and they should not have been allowed to vote. And so changing social mores, when people began to see things differently. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book called Black Reconstruction, in which he said, wait a minute, you know, you're saying that these legislators were uneducated. If you've ever seen uh, Birth of the Nation, you know, the blacks are sitting there, you know, bare, bare feet, um, eating watermelon and chicken in the, um, the House of Congress. And in fact, these were educated people. They had better education, many of them, than Andrew Johnson. And they were people who were ready to be a part of the legislature. And, and there was the violence that was unleashed against the freedmen that, we, we, that um, Du Bois talks about. So the sort of gallant Old South notion that really took hold in the 20th century, um, Du Bois fought against that. And then other historians, people like Eric Foner, came along and gave a different view of what Reconstruction was about. And as as attitudes about black people and civil rights began to change, then historians began to look at things differently. And the other thing is people think that there's some people, I know you don't, but some people think that history is just this static thing and that the interpretations remain the same. You get the story, it's like reading to your kids, and if you try to skip over any part of Dr. Seuss, they say, wait a minute, that's not what it says. But history is always changing. New interpretations, you find out new things, you see the world differently, 
and people began to look, take a different look at Reconstruction. And when they did that, they took a different look at Andrew Johnson. And that's when his star began to fall. Because how can you, how does, how can, what can you say for someone who says, this is a white man's government, and we're gonna keep it that way? Um, how could he, in today's world, be a hero? Particularly when there are other people. See, the thing is, I, I've, I've been criticized in this book because I'm pretty, pretty open about his racial attitudes. And people say, well, you're judging him by our times. But I'm really not. Even during his time, people were saying, you know, this is a little much for us. I mean, he, this guy has real prejudices against black people. So he was, there were people at the time who wanted to do something different. I think it's so important for Americans to understand that. Back to this point about history not being inevitable. There were people at the time who wanted to include blacks into the political system. It was not a uni it was not a situation where all whites felt any one way about this issue. So it's not it's not presentism to point out that in his time there were critical mass of people who had power, people in Congress who wanted to do something different, and they ended up being thwarted. Um, the fact that they lost doesn't mean that it wasn't. And important. It was, in fact, a very important, contested part of the conversation at that time. So there was no monolithic white opinion against black participation. So that's why I think it's important to study the lives of people who are not, not you know, they're not popular necessarily. He's not uh, a person who is, I should say, and I confess to you, he's not a warm and friendly person. In, in a way, he doesn't, I mean, Jefferson has a shrine, right? He's got a house that everybody wants to go to. You can, you know, you can read about Jefferson and his horses and his wine. You don't even have to pay attention to politics. Andrew Johnson doesn't have that many sides to him, but he is at a critical moment in American history, a moment that we are still living with today, I think. And, you know, he should not be an obscure president. He is one of, he may be, a judge by some people as one of the worst presidents, but he has to be counted as one of the most important presidents because there was no more critical time uh, than the years in which he was at the head of the government. And I say, and I say in the book, and I really do think it's true, he made us who we are in ways that we need to find out about. And we also, as I said, need to find about the roads not taken because I think it, it shapes our understanding of what we can do today if we understand that there were choices in the past and people made them and this is why we are, as I said, the country we are today for better and for worse and he helped shape that and so that's why I think people need to know about him, whether they love him or want to, you know, would like to have dinner with him or whatever, he's critical to the American, the American story. So with that, I'd like to take your questions. How would you respond to the question of the effect of the congressional elections of 1862 on his uh, attitudes? Did it have it, a change of any sort after that? What's the last thing you said? Uh, I was asking about whether the elections, the congressional elections yeah. of 1862, mm -hmm. had an effect on uh, uh, Johnson's policies. Well, he, you know, he really tried to. What? No, I'm sorry. He really, I think it did affect his view. It made him combative. Um, he does this disastrous, you know, he, he feels that he has to, that he can kind of make things up and uh, make a new party. What it, that I think those elections made him think that he could develop a new national party. What he wanted to do gave him the idea of uniting conservatives from the North and the South into one party and to sort of to sort of change any kind of sort of make sure that there is to sort of serve as a bulwark against any transformation of the South, and so I think the all of the political actions of that time period, he's sort of thinking all the time about how can I get around all of this? What can I do to um, to cement my power and to make sure that my 
my way prevails. So I think the critical thing about that is that it makes, it was the first time that he starts to think that he could transcend, well, I mean, they had the National Union Party, but he wanted to do something different and do, go to a completely different way of united conserv uniting conservatives all over the country to try to hold back any effort at transforming the South. Um, someone asked me a question. First, let me state you know, my total ignorance. Uh, is it feasible that there was a power vacuum and that the only people who could uh, fill that, that vacuum were people who wanted the situation to be the way that, uh, that he directed it? What do you mean? Um, that there was nobody to, to lead in the South other than the plantation owners? Oh, the, oh. well, he could have picked different leaders. I mean, he, what he, he, he could have used, what he, he tried to do was to keep the military. Military is down there. The United States Army is down there. You know, leaders who could have, in fact, um, if, he, if he wanted to keep the South under, if he had wanted to keep the South under military rule, they could have led. There were unionists there. There were, um, the other misconception about the South is that everybody there was, everybody in these states um, favored disunion. There were political people in place that he could have that he could have championed, that he could have supported, if you wanted to follow the program of the Republicans. But you're right; there was nobody. The the Southern leaders who were there were the best people to do what he wanted to do. But there there were other people. He could have made different choices about um, about you know about governors and and all those kinds of things, but not and have them do what he wanted to do. Turn to unionists, for example, people who were, uh, who would remain loyal to the United States, but he chose not to do that. There were leaders who could have, who could have, um, I think, could have carried the day, but they wouldn't have done what he wanted. I, um, I read The Hemings of Monticello, and it was an incredible book. Thank you. Just incredibly well researched and written. I enjoyed it thoroughly, thank you. Um, my question is, from your research, did Johnson have, as far as you know, any experience in his younger years um, with an African American that might have influenced his views towards them as an adult? Not that I know of. There were not many blacks in, he grew up in, um, in eastern Tennessee and in the places, <coughs> there were not lots of, not lots of blacks in his town and there's no record of this. Um, that's one of the difficulties about his early, early life. You could look at demographically. You know that there were enslaved people in the area, but there's no hint of any kind of, of connections that he had with black people until he buys his first. He buys his first slave when he uh, goes to the to the legislature, and that's the first inkling that I have of any connection to to African American people. Uh, to follow up on your phrase, the road not taken, in your research, were you able to discover specific plans that Lincoln had about the Freedmen's Bureau and uh, political rights of black people to be integrated more slowly that might have worked? Because we all know that it was the great tragedy for the South, as well as the black population, that he was assassinated. Well, he had, he had reconstruction plans that people describe as mild. I mean, he was being very conciliatory towards the South. But historians, people who have studied this far more than I have, um, have suggested that what Lincoln was doing, Lincoln, Lincoln's gift as a politician was to be able to read the situation and change. And during the war, there were certain measures that he was taking during the war that people speculated, you have no way of knowing, might have changed after the war is over. One of the things that he didn't get a chance to see was what leniency, how, how Southerners responded to leniency. When Johnson gets in and begins to, you know, to sort of, you know, veto legislation and, you know, take a firm stand against congressional Republicans, that tells people in the South that 
wait a minute, whites in the South, we can hold out. And people actually said this. There, there are recollections of people who said, you know, we would have taken anything that was, any proposal that was given to us, but he gave us hope for white man's government. And so we decided to stand firm. The question about Lincoln is whether or not he would have kept up the policy of leniency if he saw what it was buying. And what it was buying in the South was wholesale violence against African Americans. I mean, there are stories about, this man talks about going into a town in Texas and finding um, this little settlement and finding 27 people hanging from the trees, men, women, and children. And they talked about rivers, you know, with people floating, bodies floating down. I mean, it unleashed a torrent of violence on, on African Americans. And you wonder, and Lincoln knew about this, Carl Schurz did sort of a tour of the South and comes back and explains all this to, excuse me, to Johnson knew all about this, explains this to Johnson. And you don't know, I mean, if Lincoln was the Lincoln that people think he was, you have to think that that would have made him, I mean, we have sort of this, I call it like a slow motion genocide that's going on. You think he might have changed his policy. So, you know, there are all kinds of speculations about what Lincoln would have done, but we do know that at the during the war, at the end, he was looking for ways to be conciliatory. And we do know that conciliation brought some really, really bad things out in Southerners, and we just don't know how he would have responded to that. Hi there, I have read all of your books, um, I, from Bernard Can Read, to The Hemings of Monticello, to Jefferson uh, and Sally Hemings, and they're just awesome. Thank you. Um, it's just kind of brought me back into that world. And you answered the question that I came with uh, at the beginning of your talk. You talked about how difficult it was to read because that's what I was going to ask you is how, how can you look at these records? How could you, uh, it just seemed like it would be so painful. So you answered that for me. So I, I, I bring a second question is what do you think caused us to survive and thrive and create such an amazing culture knowing the, the details that you know about what Africans in America have been through. What, what do you think allows us to stand here now? Why, why weren't we just pretty much, why, why weren't we like, very much like Native Americans, a very reduced, um, much smaller part of the American um, life of America? What, what, what made us become what we are? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, well, Native Americans, we can ask, I mean, we can answer it to some degree. The first thing that happened to Native Americans is that they died of disease upon contact with the Europeans. I mean, just, you did, they'd have to fire a shot. Lots of people died from, you know, measles, I mean, any, all the diseases that, uh, that they had never had. And so that, that, that wiped out lots of people right there. Um, also, <clears throat> the, the thing for Native Americans, the, the plan for Native Americans was to get rid of them, you know, remove them from the land and get rid of them. The plan for African Americans was to enslave them, right, to enslave us. And so the difference between, I mean, there's, a, there's an economic interest that planters had in African Americans that didn't exist with Native Americans. But as far as what we did, what African Americans did. I mean, I think the will to survive is very strong in all people. And um, certainly family, the, the ability to, to adapt, um, the family to include not just uh, a mother and a father, but aunts and uncles and people took on children who, at, whose parents were sold. Um, people cared for them, the notion of caring for kin and all of those kinds of things. I think that, that those structures, those family structures that um, people decry in some sense because they're not, you know, they're not that sort of nuclear family uh, was something that scholars have pointed to as that developed into a, a strength for African Americans. Um, also, African American at blacks and other places didn't survive in the same way. Um, there were about people estimate between seven hundred and a million African Americans who, Africans who were brought to America. Many, many millions more to Brazil and the West Indies and Cuba. But those places, in those places people died at huge rates and 
what they kept doing was bringing more Africans to this to to Brazil and those places. Um, Sugarcane cultivation, which is horrific, horrific for um, for uh, uh, fertility, all those kinds of things. I mean, it's, we had a different different crop system here. So 750,000 people, basically, to a million people, become 35 million people. Um, and in Brazil, you know, the numbers fell. And they have a, people, Brazil, people have a much closer connection to Africa because the people were replenished all through the 19th century, whereas most African Americans have been here since the 1700s. I mean, we're descended from people who came here at the, um, at the beginning, the high point of importation of Africans is like in the 1730s. Um, and so it's, it's a stable culture um, and more stability. Um, and as I suggested, the, perhaps the family structure as well. So there are lots of different things. Uh, religion, I think, is a part of it. Uh, something that gives you a sense of, you know, tomorrow, hope or whatever, all those kinds of things, good and bad, but there are lots of things that contribute to it. But it's, it is pretty, it's pretty amazing, um, 750 to this number of people, and um, you know, a lot of factors go into it. You spoke in the beginning about um, sort of two different proposed solutions, one being expatriation and the other one being um, inclusion in the body politic. <laughs> You speak about Andrew Johnson as having sort of a reaction against sort of inclusion of the body politic. Does he lean towards or expatriation, or does he have a vision of what to do with the black community, either politically, socially, economically speaking, as a president, or is it simply just maintaining the status quo? What do we hear about that? He, you know, he would say, or you know, said that you know he didn't care if blacks you know were sent to another place, but that was not part of the plan. I think his idea was to have blacks live in um, the United States as a form of like like serfs in a way. I mean, that not slavery. He once he was never opposed to slavery, but once it became clear to him that the end of slavery it was a political necessity, um, then he got on board. But as for blacks, I think he thought that they would exist, blacks would exist as um, sort of lower order people who were under the control of whites, no political rights. Uh, and you know, he, he said that um, you know, you know, the African race is inferior to the white race and we should bring them up to a particular point, but we should always make plain that we are, we should improve ourselves so that we always maintain the distance. So he didn't think that, I, I don't think he had any serious idea, because by the time you get, you, you can't make four million people, I mean, they're not going to get four million people out of this country, and it's just sort of re unrealistic. It was unrealistic when Jefferson was talking about this, and it's, it was way unrealistic then. Um, I just felt, he, he, I just think he thought that blacks would be here and just sort of working for whites and accepting whatever, whatever was meted out. Did he express that publicly in Anyway, or is there a written? I mean, you said he wasn't a writer, but is there a written record of that, or is that of like, him saying these of kinds him of things? Saying these things, or is oh yeah, yeah. He established. He established oh yeah, no, 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 no. It's pretty clear. No, I'm not. No, this is not just in. He said, you know, the white man's government thing. I mean, he said these things in in right. public, and and as I said before, as a measure of you, you can't assume that everybody in the past had the same views. People, you know, excoriated some of that, and uh, no, he was pretty open about that. You've uh, commented a couple of times, I'm sorry. <laughs> you commented a couple of times about the roads, road not taken. Uh, would you talk a little bit about what the road might have looked like had uh, Johnson been uh, removed from office? If he had been removed from office and Benjamin Wade had <laughs> been president. Uh, well, the biggest problem, well, some people suggest that he was so bad that he ended up being good. That is to say, his recalcitrance brought us the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, which we all value, and that's, that's good, um, because he kept vetoing all of the plans you know, for black political rights and so forth. They needed something to try to stop him, to establish that blacks were, in fact, citizens 
and um, the black codes and all the things that were enacted to to keep them in control or, or against the Constitution. I think if there, if without Johnson's actions, there could have been land reform. Black people could have the not, the former slaves could have had land. Think of the difference between being a sharecropper and owning your own property. How the 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 um, the lack of development of black econ economic rights. I mean, we have the Fourteenth Amendment gives you political rights, but land reform would have created economic stability for African Americans. And if you have economic stability, people who have economic stability can then go on and make political rights. But if you don't have any money, as we know, uh, if you don't have money, it's difficult to do. So I think uh, without Jan Johnson thwarting things, the political rights would have been there, the economic rights, uh, the economic power uh, within the community, self-sufficiency would have been there. I mean, the, the, the uh, people in the South could have done what they wanted to do. I mean, obviously, the, the Southern whites were not going to give up here. But if the difference between owning land, being able to grow your own food, and not depend upon other people, I think that that, I think it would have changed things uh, enormously. So the underdevelopment of black economic rights uh, was a, I think it would have been different without him. So political rights, uh, we would have had. Uh, economic rights, I think, the economic power, we would have had. And that's, I think that would have changed the course of the development of, of black America. Uh, we waited, we waited 100 years uh, for, well, until the, the 1965, to the Voting Rights Act to have all of the, the power, the political power that was supposed to be there realized. But I do think the lack of land reform was the big, was the big um, a problem with his presidency. And Benjamin Wade, another president, would have done, would have done better. Because the Congress was willing to go along with this, and they could have, he probably wouldn't have, they wouldn't have pulled out, uh, would have a different view of, of, of the management of the South, all those kinds of things. I mean, Southerners would have been recalcitrant, but they would have known that African Americans had perhaps a friend in the White House. The president, I mean, one of the things I, I should say, and, and as I'm, you know, sort of talking about Andrew Johnson in these terms, I mean, I, I talk in the book about uh, the perils of great man history. You know, people criticize great man history, make one person responsible for everything. Similarly, I have to say, Johnson can't be held responsible for all that went wrong. But he was the president. And in a tripartite system of government, the president is what in the old days that they would call the president is the energy of the government. The president is the symbolic leader. People look to the president, not the Supreme Court, not the Congress, as a leader. And when you have a president who is sending signals to the defeated enemy that I'm on your side, essentially, or who is telling, you know, sort of using the office of the presidency to communicate this message, I think it changes the atmosphere. I mean, even, even if it's not legislation, it changes the way, the president is supposed to be a leader, and he led, but he led in a particular way. And so I think a different type of leader would have changed the atmosphere in the country. Would it have been the land of milk and honey? No. But I don't think we would have had to wait as long as we did, uh, as long as we have, um, to bring blacks into, into full citizenship. Thurgood Marshall, in one of his opinions, talked, uh, talked about this, of saying that you know, if, uh, maybe it was the Bakke decision. He said, we wouldn't have had to do this <laughs> if things had been taken care of, started to take care of, Never, not fixed all at once, but if they'd started this process really back in the 1860s, uh, some of the things that we were dealing with in the 50s and the 60s would not have been necessary. I've often wondered um, whether presidents choosing a vice president uh, as the, a candidate. Today we, we talk about balanced tickets, right? Uh, you wonder whether Johnson and Lincoln had a conversation, and what? Uh, and of course, no president expects to get shot going to the theater. Uh, no. But uh, you wonder: is there any historical evidence that they shared information about this? I'm choosing you as my vice president because these are the things. Should something happen to me, I want uh, to be followed up on. No, 
<laughs> there's not, no, there's not. I mean, this whole, as I said, it's a mysterious thing. I mean, people, and I, and I combed biographies of Lincoln and Johnson and other people to try to figure out, you know, what exactly happened here. And people have sort of operated forensically, um, figuring out, well, it must have, this must have been the reason because this is in fact the good thing that was accomplished by this. But no, I, I, I know of no, you know, letters or things that passed between them about, you know, here, here are the things that I want to take care of. They only had, I mean, you, know, you don't, didn't have many meetings. I mean, this is, this is really, uh, Lincoln is shot pretty quickly uh, after all of this, and they had not uh, had time to confer about things. But it's one of those, it makes you understand, it drives home how important a vice president is. You know, because Lincoln couldn't have, as you said, couldn't have imagined what was going to happen. But it was this incredibly, obviously, fateful thing in lots of different ways. But no, there's no, no sense of how these people shared information about what, what he, what role uh, Lincoln expected him to, to play in the event of anything, any problems with Lincoln's survival. I, w I would think that that'd be a good book for you to write. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That is to say, conversations between presidents and vice presidents in, in the choosing process. Uh, I think very today we know that it all has to do with politics, mm -hmm. that it has to do with balanced tickets, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you want to get elected first, and you don't think you're going to get killed, or there's a, probably a pretty strong possibility given this, the kind of society we have that that's going to happen. Well, actually, but, Lincoln, there were attempts on his life before. So, I mean, I think he, he it's not, it, it's probably not something that it probably crossed his mind before then, but you have to, I mean, you have to proceed as if you are, are the leader. That would be an interesting book. I, I'm not going to write it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think I got other, other Jefferson things to do and Hemings things to do, but I wonder if somebody has written that. It sounds like something that you don't think so. I don't know. I'm, I've never heard of it. Yeah, I'm not, I've not heard of it either, but it, it is a good idea. <laughs> I was wondering if there was any kind of um, uh, resistance to um, uh, Johnson's policies. And we know that there was, in, in New England, a very active abolitionist group, people who helped with the Underground Railroad. Um, what were they doing during Reconstruction? Oh, there was a lot of opposition. Douglas, you know, spoke out against him, and the newspapers, the, the Northern new newspapers sort of went back and forth on him because, you know, as I said before, he was treason must be punished, and you know I'm going to avenge. You know, our, our soldiers didn't die in vain, and all of this. This was a very, very visceral um, subject, viscerally important subject for lots of people. So there was opposition to him, and um, you know, not from abolitionists, from newspaper editorials, very, very strong stuff. Uh, as it becomes clear that he's really, really recalcitrant, that he, he's not going to give any quarter on it. So he wasn't unopposed. He was a very controversial figure. I, I said before that he had this idea of, you know, as he was looking, surveying the political scene, he, he, he thought, I could find a way to unite conservatives all over the country, and we can beat back uh, any kind of, of, of change of policy. And um, he really didn't think that he, he thought that he could do it. He really didn't see any problem with his capacity to do that. He was always, you know, even before he was, um, even before he's president, he's thinking of ways to try to pull together conservatives. And um, once he gets into office and once he begins to try to you know, move the country or make the country stand still, people do in fact oppose him. And he ends up pleasing nobody. You know, I mean, what, by the time, even though he escapes being removed from office, nobody likes him. Even the people that he'd been trying to appease, they didn't trust him. The Southerners in the, in the South, white Southerners, did not trust him at all. Jefferson Davis hated him. Um, what? Jefferson Davis hated him because he, well, he, um, for the Homestead Act. The Southern grandees hated the Homestead Act. They said, why are you giving this land to these poor white people? You know, make them work for it. It's like a, they thought it was like a welfare prod, uh, you know, a, a thing, you know, giving land to, to people. And so he was not, he was not to their liking at all. Um, but in the end, he ended up not pleasing anybody. Thank you. 
Well, that you mentioned the Homestead Act, I think the only solution to the whole thing would have been if there's a financial solution, because you couldn't let out all these thousands of people into the street that had been sheltered, they didn't even know what money was. They had to have land. If they were not given land, no matter what they did, it would not have succeeded. They had to have something else because if there's a small, like Lynn Lutan says, when the barn is full, everybody's nice. If you go into the subway, here comes a, a car, it's empty, they'll let you go in. If there's two seats, he goes right in. Nobody's helping you out if there's not enough to go around. In fact, my mother comes from a, my parents came from an island in the West Indies that, um, well, incidentally, they helped the United States, the uh, colonies to win the war against England because they supplied them with munitions. But when they freed the slaves, the queen, Queen Emma, gave every single slave owner 80 guilders and every slave 40 guilders. This way, the slave owners didn't have the animosity. They got paid and the slaves got something to start out with. The slaves were let out like animals, with no place to go, no money, no nothing. You couldn't, even no matter what Johnson did, unless he made them have, uh, uh, as you said, the Homestead Act or something like that, it, would, it could not succeed. In fact, today, I think they're still suffering from some people that come with that, maybe the government owes them something. Well, there's a lot in that. Um, I think, I think slaves did, well I know, slaves understood money. Um, lots of slaves were hired out, um, they worked for other people, uh, you know, a lot, there's not all plantation slavery. And one thing slaves did know how to do, of the many things slaves knew how to do, was to farm. I mean, they were the ones who were the real farmers in the South. And it was, that's why the Freedmen's Bureau and those things concentrated said, we've got to get these people land. We have to, and that's all they wanted. There's a very poignant story, you know, I talk about um, uh, in South Carolina, they had given slaves land, and because of Johnson's policies, they took it back from them. And these people said, you know, wait a minute, you know, this had been given to us, we've worked here, and, you know, this is ours, and it, it was taken away from them. So land was critical. Because you know this country, we were a nation. We were a nation of farmers, uh, well into the 20th century. And to be outside of that, to be sharecroppers, not to own anything, not to have any kind of power over your own life. Um, yeah, I mean, economic rights and political rights go to hand in hand. If you don't have land or ownership, then that's a real problem. I'm uh, curious. You said that. Uh Johnson replaced Buchanan as the worst president just this year. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any decade-by-decade uh, decade kind of accounting for the, the, uh, the level of, of favor of Johnson in this country? My, my feeling is that, uh, that it's possible that Johnson was more favored the closer you go back. Oh, there's no question. There's no, I mean, the, the surveying bit, that's a, that's a modern thing. It is modern. You know, that's a pretty modern thing, you know, of going around and asking, because, you know, you, can, you have the internet and you can, they, have, they ask you, I've done them every year, you kind of fill out a little survey and you X in a little box. But I, you, can, you can certainly look at historians. I mean, if you were to do it, it is clear that he was favored. Uh, in the early, at the end of the 19th century, in the early 20th century, there was a school called the Dunning School of, of Reconstruction. Dunning was a, uh, a professor at Columbia. And you can see about the kind of favor biographies. You can tell by, if you look at biographies uh, during that time right. period, most of them are written, you know, er long ago, and they were favorable biographies of Johnson. So well, I'm thinking about, but I was in public school in New York City in, in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. Our view of Reconstruction was not a very positive view. Oh no, that's right. I mean, uh, Du Bois is is writing the 30s and the 40s Black Reconstruction around that time. So it took it took a while for people to sort of 
get to the point where they realize, hey, wait a minute, you know, look at the stuff this guy is saying here, and is this the kind of thing that we want to, to countenance? So certainly the 30s and the 40s, it really, his, his fortunes began to change, I think, in the late 50s and the 60s. And people said, wait a minute, we can't, you know, look, look at this, this record here. So he, he enjoyed um, uh, favor for a very long time, and it's, it's sort of hard to imagine that he will come back as a sort of beloved figure. Uh, but, he will, no, but he will definitely continue as somebody, as I said, that you have to look at because this period, Reconstruction is so, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, that whole era is so critical, as I said, to where, to where we are now. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>